Mr. Lauder, you're next for band call, Mr. Lauder. I am coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, just as fast as my legs will carry me. Ah. Ah, good morning, sir. Good morning to you. Nice to see you this fine Sunday morning. I'm looking forward to an exciting week in the theatre because I've been told you're one of the finest musicians on the circuit. Now, you should have all the music there and in running order. Yeah. Now, hear about that. I know you musicians like to put marks in your music for your own guidance. Well, that music costs me a lot of money. And I'd appreciate it if you put your marks in pencil and not pen, as I'm sick and tired rubbing out possible winners for the 2.30. <laughs> What's that, son? Oh, the local press. Oh, well, I'm always happy to meet gentlemen of the local press. <laughs> you just have a wee seat up there and I'll get to you in a minute. Yes, thank you. <laughs> oh, here, by the way, the name is Lauder. Harry Lauder, that's L-E-U-D-E-R. Yes, uh-huh. Uh, no, 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 Leander's another act, a, a mind reader, a memory man. Oh, he's very good, he could go way back, never misses a day, a time, or a place. But he won't be here this week, no. He missed his train. I think he forgot to set his alarm. Now, this song comes at the very beginning of the act, when the audience are sitting there frozen-faced. I come on all happy and cheery because I've not seen them yet. And they're sitting there like a judge and jury in a murder trial. And although they haven't discussed it amongst themselves, they have reached the unanimous verdict that I am guilty. And that's before I sing. So, I've got to come on all happy and cheery. Make sure the two start tapping, start clapping their hands and time and the music so when the verdict does come, I at least get a recommendation for mercy, a coupled with a plea of mitigating circumstances, owing to the fact that I'm on this bill far too early. And you can put that in your paper, son. <laughs> so keep it bright and never let them remember they had to pay to get in. Nice and cheery, that's it, lovely and bright. I'm going to marry a hurry, sweet little carry a hurry on the 5th, the 25th of January, January. What we can hear a little like all for little, little on the 5th, the 20th. I'm going to sing a wee verse. I've never been so deep in love as what I am the new. I haven't slept for weeks and weeks. I don't know what to do. Her name is Carrie McIntosh, the last that I adore. I've never been so many. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, 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 no. There's a wee rallentando there. You just got to follow me. Look, give me a seventh and I'll show you. I've never been so many over anyone before. That's the way we're going to do it. Just like that. And you can mark it in the music. Button, pencil, no in pen. Oh, I'm going to marry a hurry, sweet little carry a hurry on the 5th, the 25th of January, January, what we can do, a little like Alpha Lure, a little on the 5th, the 25th of January, oh, I'm going to marry a hurry, sweet little carry a hurry on the 5th, the 25th of January, January, what we can do, a little like Alpha Lure, a little on the 5th, 25th of January, oh, how are we? We can do a little like all for little, little on the fifth, twenty fifth of January. Oh, oh. oh, that was bro. That was bro. Now, let's look at number seven. When we get to number seven, you'll find in number seven. Oh, quiet, please. We're trying to rehearse. If you don't mind, we are rehearsing. If you are going to knock the theatre down, could you at least do it in time with the music? Uh, yeah, I'll get to you in a minute, son. Now, you just uh, sit there and read your paper. Oh, here, by the way, when does this interview come out? Oh, you don't know. Well, you know what that means, don't you? That means I'm going to have to buy a newspaper every day, whether it's in or not. And then on Friday, we'll find out it's been postponed the following week. That's very expensive. <laughs> now, this next song, 
is exactly the same as the last, but it is entirely different. Oh, I'm a curtain of firm. Oh, honey, wait a minute, no, 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 wait a minute. We've got the glimmers on. Hello. Can you? Ah, it's lovely. Ah, you can see me now. Ah, <laughs> just try and follow me wherever I go. One more time, please, maestro. Oh, I'm Kurt and a famous doctor. She's one of the nicest I've ever seen. Her cheeks, they are a rosy red. Her age is just with 17. <laughs> when I throw my eyes around her waist and try to steal a kiss, she'll wriggle and wiggle and twist and twiggle until you hear her shouting this. Will you stop your tickling, John? <laughs> stop your tickling, John! <laughs> Never make me laugh, they hurt you. Oh, you'll make me chance. I wish you'd stop your nonsense. Just look at me, Paul. Stop your tickling, tickle, 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 stop your tickling, John. That's it, all the way over here now. Oh, I went to the farm on Sunday, for she invited me for my tea. Her father and mother were both in Kirk, of course, that was all right for me. Oh, oh. Oh, what a lovely tea we had of ham and egg and bun. And after that, we had some trickle roly poly just for fun. You stop your tickling, John. Stop your tickling, John. Never make me laugh, say Hertie. Oh, you'll make me chalk. I wish you stop your nonsense. Just look at the fool. Stop your tickle, 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 tickle. <laughs> oh, <laughs> never make me laugh, say Hertie. Oh, you'll make me chalk. I wish you stop your nonsense. Just look at the fool. Stop your tickle, 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 tickle. Stop your tickle, John. Will you stop your tickle, 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 tickle. Stop. You're an awful man! And that's where the final chord comes in. Very good, that's good. Now let's go on to the next one. What, you want a break? But, but, but we've only just started. Well, okay, but don't be too long. You'll be wanting unions next. Ah, oh, well. Uh, well uh, what would you like to know, son? when I first appeared on stage. <laughs> well, that was in Narbroth, Scotland in 1880. I was about 10 at the time. It was a Band of Hope concert. Have you ever been at a Band of Hope concert? No. You have never lived. It's where the teacher to sign the pledge swearing to have nothing to do with strong drink. It's for children aged between 5 and 14. Oh, it's very effective. I never drank between five and 14. All the family used to go, all seven of us. I was the eldest. After father died, mother used to take in people's washing to keep us off from starving. I'd seen her work from eight in the morning till midnight. Whereas children, we were never hungry. Oh, we were never hungry. We were hungry for other things, for life colour, excitement. And the answer was the band of a hope. I still remember the lady in charge, Mrs. McConaughey. Right, children, down with drink, that is our motto. And remember, we must abstain from the evils of drink. Now, one of our members, young Harry Lauder, is going to sing a very special song, and I want you all to give him a very special welcome. Conceptions of this life on earth fill me with trepidation. How can we rightly show our worth, be worthy of oh, the nation? Our Majesty Victoria will guide us rich and poor, till safe and sound with victory bound we reach our heavenly shore. Until that glorious and perfect day, the simple words I'd like to see. Oh, whiskey, whiskey, 
It makes you feel so frisky. When things are bad and you're feeling sad, there's nothing like a whiskey. Whiskey, whiskey, it makes you feel so frisky. If you drink beer, then you'll feel queer. There's nothing like a whiskey. Whiskey, whiskey, it makes you feel so frisky. If things are bad and you're feeling sad, there's nothing like a whiskey. Whiskey, whiskey, it makes you feel so frisky. If things are bad and you're feeling sad and you're in a street and you can't wait and the man's been sent for last month's rent and you're out of gin and the roof was in. There's nothing like a whiskey. Come get an ease up, come get a breeze up. Drink them! <laughs> and I was 10 at the time. And you know, it was the first time I realised the power I had in my hands over an audience. You couldn't hear Mrs McConaughey for all the five-year-olds rushing over to the nearest pub. <laughs> no, of course they didn't run over to the nearest pub. But there was a band, a Hope concert. Oh, the rest was just my imagination. And I always had a wild imagination. I remember I was 12 when I said to my mother that one day she would walk through the doors of a mansion house. Oh, she just laughed. In 1882, when you were born in poverty, you died in poverty. But I was determined and ambitious. And one day she did walk through the door of that mansion house. I was 12 when I left school and went to work in the local coal mine as a boy. 10 shillings a week. And that was to keep all the family. I was working in the mines when I met my wife, Nance. Her real name was Nancy, but I always called her Nance. And I first saw her at the pits, she was only 16 and she was beautiful. I was just a miner. She was the daughter of the foreman of the pit, Nancy Valens. But we fell in love. <laughs> we got married. Well, here in what a wedding. Everybody bought a ticket. <laughs> well, that was a custom back then. <sighs> All right, we moved into a one room miner's row cottage with running cold water. We had nothing, but we were happy. She gave me a fine son, a good life, and there was never anybody in the world for me but her. By 19, I was working all day in the pits, and in the evenings, I was entering singing competitions. I won this gold watch, Irish gold. Another prize was a job in the theatre, and all my pals said, ah, oh, you'll be back digging coal like the rest of us. And they were right. In less than a month, I was back digging coal, and the only person that didn't say I told you so was Nance. Nance was a wee woman, warm, friendly, a natural mother, and she had in her a strength that sustained me. If I'd given up, she would have accepted it, but there would have been that look of disappointment in her eyes, and I refused to see that look. And I refused to give up. I got another chance. I left the pits and went touring Scotland again. And this time, it worked. I was soon earning four pounds a week and sharing top of the bill. <laughs> no bad, eh? No bad. And I could have done that for the rest of my days. But London was the heart of the music hall. You could live all your days in Scotland and not be known in London. So I saved what I could, and I took my chance. I left Nance and John at home, and I went to London. I'd never been abroad before. <laughs> when I got there, nobody wanted to know me. Been there for a couple of weeks. I was down to my last few shillings. I was getting desperate. I was ready to come home. And then I got the call. Gatti's Music Hall, a last-minute replacement for someone who had fallen ill. I remember I stood at the side of the stage and said a wee prayer. Dear Lord, let the English like me. Well, he must be Scottish because it worked. Other offers poured in. I was soon playing six theatres a night. I had my own horse and cab waiting for me at the stage door, ready to take me from theatre to theatre to theatre. Oh, it was hard work, but it was work. 
So I called for Nance and John and we bought a wee hoose in Tooting. <laughs> oh. uh, but then I got the call I couldn't refuse to go back to Scotland and star as Roderick McSwanky in Aladdin at the Theatre Royal Glasgow. <laughs> Me, Harry Lauder. I couldn't believe my luck. But what I needed was a new song, a love song. Back then, comedians never sang love songs, and I was going to be different. My mother always said I had a good imagination, and you've got to have imagination in this business. If you don't, then you're easily forgotten, and if you're easily forgotten, you're just like all the rest. <laughs> I remember once in London, I was coming out of the theatre, and the stage doorkeeper stopped me. It was 1904. No, it was 1905. <laughs> I'll never forget it. Anyway, I was coming out the stage door. No, it was 1904. You're right, Mr. Loader. Rushing the game as usual. Aye, George. John's only seven. He'll be fast asleep. But my lassie's waiting up. Oh, so that's the secret, Mr. Loader. You love a lassie? Aye, George, I love a lassie, and she's a bonny lassie too. <laughs> Sometimes people just say something and it strikes a chord. I love a lassie, a bonny lassie, a bonny, bonny lassie. Bonny lassie, bluebell, bluebell, lily in the dell, da da dee. Da, 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 da. Ah, I love a lassie. Nah. Da, 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 da. I love a lassie, a bonny, bonny lassie. She's as pure as the lily they fair. She's as Sweet as the heather, the bonny purple heather, Mary, my Scotch bluebell. I love a lassie, a bonny healing lassie. If you saw her, you would fancy her as well. Oh, you would. I met her in September, put the question in November, and I'll soon hear all to myself. Her father has consented, and I'm feeling quite contented, and I went and sealed a bargain with a kiss. Och, I sit in weary, weary, when I'm thinking of it, my dearie, you'll always hear me singing this. I love a lassie, a bonny, bonny lassie, she's as pure as the lily and the dell. She's as sweet as the heather, the bonny purple heather, a merry my Scotch bluebell. Now, at this point, a wee lassie, dressed all in white, looking just like an angel, she arrived on stage, and I sang to her. I love a lassie, a bonny, bonny lassie. She can warble like the mavis in the dell. She's an angel every Sunday, and a jolly lass on Monday. She's as bonny as her namesake, the bluebell. She's nice and neat and tidy, and I meet her every Friday. It's a very special night, I would they miss. I'm enchanted, I'm in rapture, for my heartless darling's captured. She's intoxicated me with bliss. I love a lassie, a bonny, bonny lassie. She's as pure as the lily on the dell. She's as sweet as the heather, the bonny purple heather, a merry my Scotch bluebell. Mary, my Scotch bluebell. Hey! <laughs> ah, indeed. And you know, you can always tell when a song was a hit in those days. Ah, uh, though the next day the message boys were all singing it and whistling it in the street. No need for a record chart in those days. Oh, no. You just had to use your lugs. I've always been a Scottish comedian. Well, no, actually, I prefer the term minstrel, but no. I actually started as an Irish comedian. No kilt, just the trousers. <laughs> I even had an 
headed note paper of 1892, singer of the famous Callaghan Call Again. I was very famous in 1892. At least three people knew me. Well, make that four. Says I to Callaghan, you'll have to call again. Call again to Callaghan, says I. Says I to Callaghan, you'll have to call again. For I haven't got your ammo anymore. Callaghan vowed that he would call again. He said he put the coppers on my track. So my temper rose, and I said to Callaghan, call again and take your trousers back. Oh, but there's worse. I once had to sing the song as an Englishman. Somebody thought it'd be a novelty. It was a disaster. <sighs> I'm guilt edged Betty with a guilt edged smile. A guilt edge eyeglass and a guilt edge style. I have a guilt edge checkbook and a guilt edge life. And all the girls would like to be my guilt edge. Why, I say I'm guilt edge better with a guilt edge smile. A guilt edge eyeglass and a guilt edge style. I have a guilt edge checkbook and a guilt edge life. And all the girls are gay. It's my life. <laughs> well, maybe now you'll understand why I stuck to Scottish songs. Still, that always made my son John laugh. I bought him his piano when he was six. By the time he finished, he had a music degree at Cambridge University. He got that just to please me. Many a night we had round that piano. John, Nance, myself. There was a song that I wrote, and I can't be sure, I think it was his favourite. Oh, there's somebody waiting for me In a wee cottage down by the sea With a smile that I'm longing now to see Oh, there's somebody waiting for me. Nance was not very musical. But I knew if I could get her toes tapping, I was on the right road. I always knew a good tune when I heard one. You need a few essentials, the right ingredients, and the first is the beat. I always said if you couldn't sing the tune, you could eye whistle it. And if you couldn't whistle, you could eye just sit there and tap your toes in time. She's a lass for me, she's a lass for me. I've never seen another face that could ever take her place. She has locked my heart and thrown away the key. She is, I, she is, she's a lass for me. Tura lura 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 she's as sweet as honeydew, the lass I kill a cranky. Tura lura 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 she's as sweet as honeydew, the lass I kill a cranky. And here's a song they wrote for me. Oh, the far colons are pulling me away, a step I wear my crummock to the road. Oh, the far colons are putting me away, as if I wear the sunlight for my lord. Sure, by tumble and loch rannoch and loch but I will go by heather tracks with heavens in their piles. If it's stinking in your inner head, braggarts in my step, you've never smelt the tangle of the aisle. Oh, Jeannie, my nails, I love with me. I'm as happy as I can be. How would you like a view for me? Balderoodle, I do Hey, Jeannie, my nails, I love with me. I'm as happy as I can be. How would you like a view for me? Balderoodle, I do How would you like a view for me? Balderoodle, I do <laughs> Very good, very good. 
And here, do you know, I used to make cylinder records before they invented the flat ones. And even my recordings were different because I discovered there was a wee bit at the end that nobody ever used. And that just hated waste. So this is what I used to do. How would you like if you're one wee? Father Riddle Idle. <laughs> no finished yet. Aye, well, that's me just heading down the road to my wee hame and my wee nan's eye. Good night, die. <sighs> Still no finished. Well, I'm back again. I got you that time. <laughs> well, good night, the night, aye. <laughs> it made people remember me. It's called technique. And I learnt a few of those. And one was this, never enter by the back door. I always had to make an entrance, whether it was Buckingham Palace or the White House, because the press were all at the front. And that's what the theatre taught me. I was educated in Music Hall and the University of Life. You were in and out of towns like a commercial traveller, one scene easily forgotten. And I was determined not to be forgotten. It was my most important rule. I mean, there were millions of singers. There was Caruso. There was Gilly. And there was Harry Lauder. <coughs> oh, oh, yes, I am. Um, let's do roaming next. Now, this was one of my biggest triumphs. I sang it in the pantomime. Oh, no, you didn't. Oh, yeah, yes. Don't you start. This is 1121 and bring it up at the end. I've seen lots of bonny lasses travelling far and wide. But my heart is centred now on bonny Kate McBride. And though I'm not a lad that throws a word of it, I'm surprised myself sometimes, oh, I've got to say. Roman in the gloaming by the bonny banks of Clyde. Roman in the gloaming with my lassie by my side. When the sun has gone to rest, that's the child that I love best. Oh, it's lovely, Roman in the gloaming. I've just got to see if my lassie's here yet. No sign. Let me tell you what happened. Last night in the gloaming we were sitting side by side. I kissed her twice, I asked her once if she would be my bride. She was shy and so was I, and we were both the same. But I get brave and braver on the journey coming home. Roaming in the gloaming by the bunny banks of climb. Roaming in the gloaming with my lassie by my side. When the sun has gone to rest, that's the child that I love best. Oh, it's lovely, Roman and the Glovel. <laughs> I know my lassie down in Ohio, and just to see her, I will go, I owe. I won't forget her, she stole my heart, and so I'm going back to Ohio. <laughs> I know my lassie down in Ohio. Oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, no, 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 no. That is the best you've played all day. But we're not actually doing that one. That was for the American tour. Oh, I first went there in 1907. <laughs> uh, I do apologise about that. No, of course I didn't need to go. Just like I didn't need to go to London, but it was a challenge. <laughs> America was the new world, the land of opportunity, with one serious drawback. I'd never heard of Harry Lauder. I just had to go and complete their education. When I got there, nobody wanted to know me. The agent who had booked me disappeared. But I had one great advantage. I was born in Scotland. And we Scots have a sort of magic bush telegraph. It's a Scotia Nostra. Yes, the work can soon get out, especially if you're a showman. The week we opened in Broadway, I got my friend Lord Dewar to get his pipe band to march down Fifth Avenue with me at the back in an open-top car. <laughs> it was a sort of subtle approach, you know. <laughs> but it worked. That week, the theatre was full of Scots. The Americans couldn't buy a ticket. 
And that's the best advert you can get for the theatre. Does it matter if it's sold out with your fellow countrymen, so long as they couldn't buy a seat? I was looking for an agent that same week, and I found one. Just a young lad, unknown, but he went on to become the world's greatest agent, William Morris. And you know, we never signed a contract. We just shook hands. <laughs> By 1910, I was the world's highest paid entertainer. And that is when a shilling was a shilling. I even had my own train going coast to coast in America. I had my own baggage car, restaurant car, sleeping car, had all my scenery and my orchestra, the Harry Lauder Special. I remember once we were due to open in Broadway and the boat was late getting in from England. They had to go and get all the out-of-work acts to go and entertain the audience till I got in after midnight. Over four hours late and they'd waited for Harry Lauder. Eh, no bad, eh? Another time, the theatre owners, they had a monopoly. They tried to ban my show. Well, William Morris gets straight on to the president at the White House. What an agent. He explained the situation. And the president himself phoned those theatre owners and said, if Harry Lauder did not appear, he would order the Attorney General to take action against them for violation of the trust laws. <laughs> the President of the United States of America for me, Harry Lauder. Well, no wonder I'm big-headed. <laughs> oh, here, and, and don't write that. No. <laughs> Remember, I am a humble man. Yes, sometimes. Oh, yes, I remember writing that. Uh, yeah, my mind goes to my wee hoose and noon. Well, that was a lot of rubbish. We had 22,000 acres then. There were eight of us living in the house, plus the staff. By 1914, I was ready to retire, and we didn't have a swimming pool. We had a loch. Well, it was cheaper to keep clean. <laughs> ah, well, I suppose I could have told the truth. But then the truth would have ruined that meanness image. Uh, don't go blaming me for that. That was around long before me. I mean, I always said that money wasn't meant to go round. It was made flat for packing and that people never remember your generosity, but they never forget your meanness. And I wanted the whole world to think that Harry Lauder was mean. <laughs> I remember once in Australia, I was walking past a rubbish dump and I found an old pair of battered boots. You could have put your fist right through the sole took them back to the hotel, put them outside the door to be cleaned. Nance was horrified. But better than that, I got the laces, put them under the door, tied them around the leg of the chair so they couldn't be stolen. Well, the boy that cleaned the boots didn't stop talking about it. He never forgot the boots and he never forgot Harry Lauder. There's not many people forget Harry Lauder, except maybe him. Now, this next song is very popular in Australia. Now, it is a wee dog and Doris, so lean on the wee. <sighs> There's a good old Scottish custom that has stood the test of time. It's a custom that is carried out in every land and clime. Where other Scots are gathered, it's aye the usual thing. When just before they say good night, they raise a glass and sing Just a wee dog and Doris Is a wee and lads all Is a wee dog and Doris A poor wee gang a war There's a wee wife a waiting In a wee bat and bain If you can see it's a brobrich moon Like nicht in your own eh? I like a man who is a man, a man that's straight and fair, the sort of man who is in can and all things do in shape. I like a man, a jolly man, the sort of man you know, the kind of chap that slaps your back and says, a forego. Just a wee dog and Doris. There's a wee and lads all, there's a wee dog and Doris, a four way gang of war. There's a wee wife a waiting, and a wee butt and pen. If you can say it's a brabrach, me like like I are all right, you can. <laughs> very good, very good. Hmm. Aye. We got to Australia in 1914. 
Just as war broke out, John, Nance and myself, it was my first world tour. We'd only just arrived when John's regiment was mobilised back home. It was all a bit of a shock. Uh, John was a captain in the 8th Argyll and Southern Highlanders. Within two days he was on the ship, bound for home. I had to finish the tour. His mother and I got back in time to see him in his uniform march off to the war that would end all wars. It would all be over in a few weeks. <laughs> the Germans didn't mind fighting England, but when they learnt that Scotland was in as well, oh, the Germans called the Scottish regiments the ladies from hell, on account that they all wore the kilts. Well, all except one, the Scottish horse, naturally. Everywhere you looked, the country was going to war. Even Harry Lauder, she is my daisy, my bonny daisy. She's as sweet as sugar candy, but she's off my pond of sandy. I'm weary, I'm out my dearie. For I would rather lose my whip than lose my daisy. She is my daisy, my bonny daisy. She's as sweet as sugar candy, but she's a bit for the sandy. I will, I will be my daisy. For I would rather lose my whip than lose my daisy. Yes, I would rather lose my whip than lose my daisy. Aye. That was a show called Three Cheers at Shaftesbury Theatre London in 1915. Over a year of war and things were getting worse. John was sent back from France wounded. He went and spent his days in Scotland fishing. Have you ever fished? You have never lived. John was a captain in the local regiment, and it was full of local men. People were desperate a word of their sons, their husbands, their brothers, anybody who had seen them recently. And John never failed to stop and have a wee word. He was like that. People were very good. They left us alone as much as possible. His mother and I had a, an understanding. Nothing said, nothing agreed, but just understood. During the day, he was my boy, but in the evening, he was her son, her John, her boy. Every day, she'd make up a picnic hamper for us to take to the fishing. There was enough food in there to feed a regiment. She must have been saving her ration coupons for weeks. And you daren't say, John liked the pie, because the next day, there wouldn't be one pie, there'd be six. And you dare not take anything back. Oh, no, don't take anything back. We had the only fish in Scotland with gout. Every day she would stand at the door and she'd wave us off and she'd say, Now remember, if it starts to turn cold, come right back. Oh, halfway up the road, John starts to laugh. Dad, he says, for the last 12 months, I've been up to my knees in mud. I've been soaked to the skin. I've been frozen to the bone. Isn't it a joy to hear my mother say, if it starts to turn cold, come right back. And then we got to Glen Branter. That's the Glen and Loch that I bought for John. And all we could see were Scotland's mountains, sleeping as they've slept for thousands of years. A man can ask for no more. And his son, his God, his country, and his fishing. Oh. Well, then John had to go back to France. I had to go back to work. And his mother had to go back to the hardest thing of all, the waiting. Still, I had the theatre to occupy my mind, and the theatres were full. There was a song I sang in that show, and every time I sang it, I thought of John. When the fighting is over and the war is won, 
and the flags are waving free. And when the bells are ringing and the boys are singing, Songs in every key, and when we all gather round the old fireside, and each fond mother kisses her son, all the lassies will be loving all the laddies, the laddies that fought and won. Well, we have on stage representatives of the army and the navy, but what about our newest, our hardest service, the Royal Flying Corps? Oh, there we are, son. Come up on stage. Let's see you. Oh, look, he's wearing a kilt. Well, take my advice, son. Don't you be flying upside down. You'll give the Germans an awful fright. <laughs> well, come on, everybody. Join with us on stage. Let them hear us in Berlin when the fighting is over and the war is won and the flags are waving free. And when the bells are ringing and the boys are singing songs in every key, and when we all gather round the old fireside and each fond mother kisses her son, all oh, the lassies will be loving all the laddies, the laddies that fought and won. All oh, the lassies will be loving all the laddies, the laddies that fought and won. Come in, come in. Oh, a telegram. On New Year's Eve. Imagine doing that on New Year's Eve. Here, I'm going to break my golden rule. I'm going to give you a tip. <laughs> now, don't you tell anybody you got that from Harry Lauder or you will ruin my reputation. <laughs> now, who do you think this could be from? Well, you know, it could be from the President of the United States. It could be from the Prime Minister. It could even be from His Majesty the King. Right? Because I know them, and they know Harry Lauder. <laughs> oh, of course, sir. Oh, of course. Away you go. And when it comes, have a happy new year. <laughs> and remember, you tell anyone you got a tip from Harry Lauder, and I will deny it strenuously. <laughs> Aye, good lad. There's a wee hoose on the hillside that I haven't seen for years. There's an awful longing feeling, and my eyes wiles them with tears. When I think of all the happy times I spent upon that spot, and the games we played as laddies there will never be forgot. There's a wee hoose among the heather, there's a wee hoose over the sea. There's a lassie in that wee hoose waiting patiently for me. She's the picture of perfection, oh, I would not tell a lee. If you seen her, you would love her. Just the same as me.
Thy far away from Scotland and the scenes I lose so weel. There's a beat for the old country that in every pulse I feel. And though other lands are bonny and though other folks are kind, there is one place and one only that is ever in my mind. There's a wee who among the heather, there's a wee who sour the sea. There's a lassie and not a wee who's waiting patiently for me. She's the picture of perfection, oh, I would not tell a lee. If you seen her, you would love her. Just the same as me. Aye, that's a request from a young laddie in the Cameronians, the only Scottish regiment that goes to church with an armed escort. You'd think they want to go voluntarily. Right, lads, the Kaiser must know I'm here. I wonder who told him. <laughs> Now, lads, I want to remember you're here for arrest. <laughs> Your general said to me, load up. He said, load up. I want you to go and sing to the boys so that when they're back at the front, they'll think of your singing and face the Germans. Well, here I've just got that. <laughs> right, now, who do we have here today? Let's see now. We have got some boys from the Gordon Highlanders. Where are you? <laughs> Look at that back there. Oh, from the lovely city of Aberdeen. You know, you can always tell an Aberdonian. You just can't tell them much. <laughs> and from the HLI in Glasgow, the Highland Light Infantry. <laughs> I see you. Razors at the ready, boys. <laughs> oh, here, and look. We have got Pipe Major McClellan. Ah, there he is, yes, from Perth, the Black Watch. Now, he wouldn't tell you this himself, but when he goes over the top and plays his pipes, he puts the fear of God into the Germans. They think it's a woman with a big red beard trying to eat an octopus. <laughs> and then we've got some Australians and some New Zealanders and Zacks together, and from Canada, Princess Patricia's Light Infantry, the Senior Regiment of the Line. <laughs> Oh, and here, look, we've got a couple of English regiments too. We've got the Durhams and 2nd Battalion Gloucesters just back from the front, here for a well-earned rest. Ach, well, we're all joke times and burns as we say back home. <laughs> uh, 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 it's just in case it rains, eh? <laughs> I'll tell you, the mice soon as ever they've got their tackety boots on, don't they? But they're not going to frighten us away, lads, are they? No, oh, come on, let's have a wee song here. <laughs> For she's a brawn, brawn, hell a lad, it's bright with Jock McDean. There's no one not there's such a like a man that's got frigate. A rear the line, the heather rear can tell, he's got his belt. Well, a wig, 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 a wig along the kilt. I'm the softest of the family. I'm the simple Johnny Raw, ha, ha, ha. Everything my mother believes in me, and my father puts it on to me, I know. I'm foo, the new, I'm absolutely foo, and I adore the country I was born in. My name is Jock McCraw, and I don't care a straw, for I've got something in the bottle for the ball. For he's a brock, brock, hell a lad, is right with Jock McDee. I've no one that there's such a like a wind has got brigade. And here the man, the heather, you can tell he's got his belt with a wig, wig, wig. Like a wag along the kilt, the red the man, the heather you can tell his Scottish belt. Well, the big, 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 a wag along the kilt. <laughs> All right, lads, I'll be seeing you. <laughs> well, now, seeing I have got here, I suppose you'll find this a change to hear me talking instead of singing. In fact, I, I think we, we rather enjoy a change now and again. Uh, so, therefore, having introduced myself as a speaker, let me say that I was talking with a friend who said to me, what is the idea of this million-pound scheme of yours? 
I said if you will give me your attention for a moment, I will let you know how it originated. During my visit to the front, I said to the lads out there, how are you getting on, boys? They said, how are we getting on? We? <laughs> we are winning every time. I said, I see and feel that. They said, how are you folks at home? I said, we, we're all right. Aye, ah, well, they said, well, and what are you folks at home going to do for us fellas out here after the war is finished? I said, what would you wish us to do? Well, they said, now listen. The man who comes out here and goes west is finished. The man who comes home scapeless will be too brave and honest to ever expect assistance from anybody. But it's the man who is maimed or broken whom we want you to do something for. I said, well, I'll see. I came home, thought the matter over, and I immediately got to work and organized and I'm still organizing this scheme to raise one million pound to be used in re-establishing maimed men after the war. Earl Rosebery is the Honorable President, and Lord Balfour of Burley is the Honorable Treasurer. The bankers are the Bank of Scotland, Edinburgh, and London. To me, it seems the simplest thing in the world. A million Scotsmen to dig their hands into their pooches and dig out a pound each. I have... Uh, been of some service to my country when I shall have accomplished that. At the same time, I don't wish to overlook anyone and everyone. My appeal is to the English-speaking world because I tell you now, the fears of a British soldier standing on the corner of a street, selling matches or laces, would make me wish to God that my son had not laid down his life for his country. Now look at me, and you will see the smartest lad you'll ever see. The Prince of Wales, he wanted me to go and join the army. But now I'm old and getting frail, I'm like a dog without a tail. All because the genie may fail, the last I can like a ranky. She's the sweetest honey the last the She's the sweetest the last the She's the sweetest the last Oh, hello, America. It's great to be back. And you know, it's always a lovely sight to see that lady standing at the entrance of New York Harbour saying, oh, Come in, Harry, there's no charge. <laughs> so I got on the train to Detroit and we're travelling at least five miles an hour, rushing along. So when the conductor came in, I said to him, Is it all right if I pick the flowers on the embankment as we go along? He said, Well, yes, sir. But there are no flowers on the embankment. Says I, it's all right. I've got some seeds in my pocket. <laughs> then the conductor says, you're not allowed to bring a dog in the train. I says, what dog? He says, that dog on your knee. I says, that's not a dog. That's my sporran. And the woman next to me almost fainted. She says, I've been stroking it for the last five minutes. I wondered why it wouldn't take a biscuit. <laughs> then I get to Detroit, and we're staying in a very nice hotel. It's swanky, very swanky indeed. And here, 
You know there's a Scottish lassie working in the reception. <laughs> I knew she was Scottish the minute I heard that beautiful lilt in her voice when she answered the phone and said, What does you want? I said, I want to be called in the morning. She said, Well, sleep with your windows open. Well, we're going to have a great Scottish night and we're going to start by taking a collection for the wounded ex servicemen coming back from the war. Now, I'm going to sing a wee song as the cans get passed along. And I don't want you thinking you're in a church. I don't want to hear buttons or safety pins being put in there. In fact, I don't want to hear the cans rattle at all. I want to see them stuffed full of paper. <laughs> Some people say that the kilt is not the thing to wear. In fact, they say the kilt is out of date. But I've got certain reasons why I'm wearing mine, and so I'll explain it if you only care to wait. I used to wear a pair of breeks before I took a wife. But after I'd been wed a week or three, I sold my trousers, I bought a kilt. The reason is because, oh, I'll sing it. If you listen now to me, Every night I used to hang my trousers up on the back of the bedroom door. I rue the day, that is why you say, I'll never hang them up there anymore. Because my wife, she used to rattle round my pooches when I was fast asleep beneath the quilt. In the morning when I awoke, I was always stony broke, and that's the reason now I wear a kilt. <laughs> I'm not as young as I used to be, my blood is getting thin, and I wouldn't take an awful lot to freeze. The only thing I'm frightened of is winter's coming on, and I'll feel it very cold about my knees. If I should take a freezing fit one day and kick the pail, and join that vast majority that's gone, well, maybe I'll be sorry that I ever took to kilts, and I'll wish I kept my cosy trousers on. <laughs> Every night I used to hang my trousers up on the back of the bedroom door. I rue the day, that is why you say, I'll never hang them up there anymore. Because my wife, she used to rattle round my pitches when I was fast asleep beneath the quilt. In the morning when I awoke, I was always story broke. And that's the reason now I wear a kilt. Aye, the first time I wore a kilt, I was tickled to death. I had the sporran on the inside. Well, how are you getting on with the collection boxes out there? I hope you're stuffing it full of dollar bills, eh? <laughs> you know, the lovely thing about going away is coming back and meeting old friends. I got a note from Henry Ford inviting me for a game of golf. Well, he lets me caddy, and he's such a good tipper. <laughs> so Henry Ford arrives in a Rolls Royce. I said, Henry Ford in a Rolls Royce. He said, well, I couldn't get a Ford, so I got the next best thing. So I got my wee ball, put my wee ball in my wee tee, I got my wee golf club to hit it. Oh, no, oh, this is the my golf club. Oh, no, this is the my golf club. This is my fishing rod. <laughs> it shows you the size of fish we get in Scotland, doesn't it? <laughs> well, I hit the ball right down a fairway, and the ball goes into a bunker. Well, in Scotland, we put coal in bunkers. You put sand. Anyway, I found my ball. There it was, still wrapped in its paper. And Henry Ford said to me, if you can get that out, I will give you $1,000 for your fun. Well, I didn't know whether to use a sand wedge or a shovel. But I'll tell you, I got that ball out in one stroke. And the doctor says, if I have another... He'll not be responsible. <laughs> Every night I used to hang my trousers up on the back of the bedroom door. I rue the day, 
That is why you say I'll never hang them up there anymore Because my wife, she used to rattle round my butchers When I was fast asleep beneath the quilt <laughs> In the morning I awoke I was always stony broke And that's the reason now I wear It makes the people stop and stare It's no because my knees are bare It's drafty when you're standing there And that's the reason now I wear a kilt <laughs> Give I the twine, give I. <laughs> and that's the reason I wear. It makes the people stop and stare. It's not because my knees are bare. She's wondering what I'm wearing there. I must remember that for next time. And that's the reason I wear a kilt. I will, Tom, that's another show over, eh? What was the collection this night? What? They must have been putting in personal checks to get that amount, but that's exactly what I was looking for. Now, if you add that to what the committee back home have raised, Tom, we've done it. And just a wee bit extra, just over one million pound for the boys coming back. Oh, oh, Tom. Do you think John would be proud? I hope so. I hope so. Here, what's that shouting in the street, Tom? Go and see. They couldn't know the news that quick. We've only just added it up ourselves. <laughs> America's entered the war. Just in time. Just in time. The old country was getting like Harry Lauder. Just a wee bit tired. Well, come on, Tom, what are you standing about for? Come on, get packing. We're going home. When I get back again to Barney Scotland. And some home. Oh, it's great to be back. <laughs> oh, the whole of the noon's going mad. In fact, the whole of Scotland's going mad. Uh, who can blame them, eh? <laughs> I've come straight from the pier head. I had to walk. No transport. Everybody's celebrating now that they've signed the armistice. <laughs> They've even got the flags and the bunting they put out and they're dressing the pier. <laughs> Old joke that the post office says it's just in case some of the boys come home early. It'll be a lovely welcome. <sighs> da -da 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 -da. Nance, I've been thinking about John. I've been thinking we should leave him in France, surrounded by his friends. There'll be others that would want to bring their boys back, but can't. It might look a wee bit selfish if we bring our boy back. We'll put a stone up for him in Glen Branter. For a time, just a time, it was his Glen, his loch. A man can ask for no more and his son, his God, his country, and his fishing. Ach, Nance, I'm going back to work. Well, Australia, of course. Nance, come with me. I need you. <laughs> Great. Oh, hi, it's great to be back in Australia. Oh, 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 oh. oh what's that you say, son? What, you want a song? What, here? For nothing? Oh, oh, oh. you've got an offer, cheek. Why don't you go and get a ticket for the concert? I'd rather expect something for nothing. Oh, it's sold out? Oh, well, that does make a difference. I'll tell you what, I'll sing one of my favourite songs, but I want you all to sing along. <laughs> For we parted on the shore, yes, we parted on the shore. I said goodbye, my love, for I'm off to Baltimore. Then I kissed her on the cheek, and the crew began to 
verrò ci rio di reas mi parte don the shore ci rio di rio as mi parte don the shore i can buy i'll see all tonight <laughs> Ah, so you're the new manager of the old hotel. Well, she's looking very good, very good. Nothing's changed except the prices and the sheets, I hope. Oh, a telegram. I don't like getting telegrams. Oh, the luggage, yes, aye, that one's Mrs. Lauders. That one's Mrs. Lauders. Uh, and the big one, that one's Mrs. Lauders. The wee one. Aye, that one's mine. Just put that up in the desk. <laughs> Have you got a leaky roof? Oh, you want a tip? Well, in Scotland, a tip's where we take a rubbish. Away you go and ask my manager for a signed photograph of my cell. It'll be a wee investment for your future. Hello, uh, room service. Yes, this is uh, 61,345. Oh, for a big hotel. Oh, it's underneath. 42. Ah, uh -huh. yes. I thought you'd extended. Yes, uh, could you bring uh, Lady Lauder and myself a cup of tea? No, a cup each. Yes, yes, 42. Thank you, thank you. What's that, Lance? Oh, the telegram. Oh, yes. Well, it appears that His Majesty, in his wisdom, has decided that I should become the first knight ever of the music hall. Oh, just imagine, Lance. Dan Lino, George Roby, Little Titch, all the giants of the theatre, and I've to be the first. <laughs> That's why I asked them to bring a cup of tea to my lady, Lauder. Oh, I know, I know, I know, I know, but you're stuck with it. And that everything else in life, you'll do it well. <laughs> That'll be them to see if we want milk and sugar. <sighs> Hello. Oh, a call from London. Uh, yes, uh, I'll accept, so long as there's not reverse charges. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, you're going to have to speak up. You're a long way away. Yes, yes, Lady Lord and I are both very proud. Uh-huh. Yes, it's a fine tribute to the music hall that we both love. Yes, he would have been proud too. Now, do you have our pencil there? Yeah, we'll take these numbers down. Danoon 231, Hamilton 165. Yes, now could you give them a wee call? Could you tell them that we've arrived safely and we had a lovely voyage and that we had a Captain McLeod from Tobermory? <laughs> now I've sent you postcards and when it comes, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Well, yes, of course I could have, but it's cheaper at your end. Yes, thank you. International press, Nance. Follow that, as they say in the theatre. Oh, it's going to be a great audience the next. Ladies and gentlemen, the first night of the music hall, Sir Harry Lauder. Every road through life is a long, long road filled with joy and sorrow too. As you journey on, all your heart will yearn for the things most dear to you. With wealth and love, it is so, but onward we must go. Keep right on to the end of the road, keep right on to the end. Though the way be long, 
Let your heart beat strong, keep right on around the bend. Though you're tired and weary, still journey on till you count to your happy abode. When all you love you have been dreaming of will be there at the end of the road. With a big stout heart to a long steep hill, we will get there with a smile. With a good a kind of thought and the end in view. We will cut short many a mile. So let courage every day be your guiding star all the way. Keep right on to the end of the road. Keep right on to the end. Though the way be long, let your heart beat strong. Keep right on around the bend. Though you're tired and weary, still journey on till you come to your happy abode. When all you love you've been dreaming of will be there at the end of the road. Oh. 